All right. I guess that's 60 seconds. We could go live. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this special Wednesday episode. I'm Jane Kelly. I'm a visiting assistant professor here at the School of Architecture at UIC. Also work on our events and publications. And it is my great pleasure today to welcome Dan Handel and Anthony Achivati from Manifest Journal. We are here today, here virtually, to celebrate the launch of its third issue. Um, and Manifest is, is a project, um, a, a journal about the Americas, which I think, you know, as, as a wide topic is something certainly of interest to us at the school. And, and this particular issue's theme is, is bigger than big. Um, and so I'm excited to, to have a conversation around grappling with the immense size of the Americas today, specifically through the lens of, of geological time. And I know that every all of our guests today have navigated many different time zones <laughs> to be here. So I appreciate them doing that. And also just the general weird distensions of time that we've all been uh, all been experiencing here in the last year or so. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'll just say also that about a year ago, we, I had invited Dan to come to UIC and actually do a workshop on carpets uh, with one of the studios at the time. I became aware of Dan's work at the CCA, the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal on forests. And I think both of those things, forests and, and carpets, um, definitely speak to these, Dan's interest in, in uncovering some of these things that are literally right around us or under our feet that we don't we don't often give the attention that they really can can merit, can deserve. So I'm excited to, to have their perspective as an, an Anthony's here today. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dan and Anthony. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Jane. Um, it's really great to have the chance to do a remote launch of Manifest Number no. 3 here or there or somewhere. Uh, at UIC. Um, so we want to thank uh, Director Bob Sommel for hosting this event and you, Jane, for helping us organizing the talk at the school. Um, we also want to thank designer Tal Erez, who's like behind the scenes right now for creating another striking set for this online event, which I hope you're uh, seeing right now via uh, the YouTube channel of UIC Architecture. Uh, so this is one of several events we're holding uh, for Manifest in Lima, Mexico City, Cambridge, New York City, Princeton, Halifax, and many others. Um, and the theme chosen for today, Geological Time, also presents uh, to Anthony and I an exciting avenue to explore uh, ideas that emerged uh, in the process of making Manifest but are now sort of gaining a, a life of their own. So I'm really excited that, that all of you are here with us today. I will first say a few words about Manifest. As Jane mentioned, it's an independent print publication that we work on dedicated to the art, architecture, and landscape of the Americas. It was founded by myself together with uh, Anthony and Justin Fowler with the original intention to initiate a critical and we hope uh, an imaginative conversation about the Americas. Gradually, we came to realize that uh, what we're doing is not a serial publication, but rather a number of editor thematic volumes, small books, uh, if you want, that allow both literary experimentation and anal analytical uh, investigations. So in this context, I would say, uh, just to know that our deliberate uh, use of the term Americas in the plural acquires further significance. Of course, the stuff of the continent itself transcends political borders, which expands our horizon from the plains of Patagonia to the Arctic Circle. But the term also connotes the multiplicity that exists within a given territory, an uneasy layering, if you want, of environments, peoples, and ideologies that cannot be summarized in an executive brief. Uh, but rather, they, had to be, uh, they have to be excavated, reflected upon, and constantly reimagined, which is what we hope to do with this project. And we have been fortunate to receive support for this uh, from the Graham Foundation, several anonymous donors and benefactors, as well as from a readership that extends across the globe from Thailand to Peru and from Canada to Australia. 
So while we maintain an active online presence and you can find more about our projects and our issues uh, in our website, we remain fiercely committed, and perhaps we'll talk about this later, to print as a medium of ex uh, as a main medium of exchange of ideas and experiences. So the current volume, uh, as Jane mentioned, bigger than big, brings together 50 contributors, and perhaps fitting with our subject is our largest issue yet. We have asked these contributors to consider immensity as a driving force in the creation of American narratives of space. Now, launch events are sometimes dedicated to what was already established in a given publication. But in the specific case of today's event, we feel that, uh, as I said before, the theme of geological time actually stands uh, for sort of beginning of a new torrent of ideas that uh, emanates from the materials gathered in the issue. We didn't ask for it, but uh, by getting some contributions such as Kate's or Lydia's who, who are with us today, which carefully open up this notion of immense slowness and its benefits in, it, in inquiring a different viewpoint, we think that this is a viable, viable and quite uh, provocative conversation to have right now uh, in an era of intensified rapidity. Following up on that, and it's really wonderful to be with all of you today, we'll briefly introduce each of the speakers with the bios they shared with us, briefly describe their published piece, and then ask each of them a series of questions regarding the images they shared with us. Once we have asked our initial questions, we will then be happy to accept questions from the audience. And I'm very happy that Francesco Marullo from the UIC, who's been doing some very interesting work on the subject, is able to join us today ask some of his own questions and help us do what we think Manifest is really about, a well-produced, well-thought-out excuse for meaningful conversations about the Americas. First, I'd like to begin by introducing uh, Kathleen John Alder, who is an associate professor at the Rutgers Department of Landscape Architecture and a registered landscape architect with over 20 years of professional experience. Kathleen's research involves the transformative role of ecology and environmentalism in the discourse of mid 20th century landscape design. To date, this work has concentrated on the process theories of the landscape architects Ian McCarg and Lawrence Halperin. We then have uh, Lydia Zinogalo, who was born in Athens and is an architect and doctoral fellow at the ETH GTA Institute. Through her practice, Alos, she constructs architecture, landscapes, objects, and stories with projects that engage built artifacts, material culture, and the natural environment. Lydia's work on the relationship between chemistry, material cultures, and the built environment has been showcased at the Museum of Modern Art, Storefront for Art and Architecture, the Van Allen Institute, Society of Architectural Historians, Chemical Heritage Foundation, History of Science Society, and ACSA, among many other venues. And we also have with us today Francesco Marullo, who is an architect and educator. His research focuses on the relations between architecture, labor, and the space of production. He holds a PhD in the history and theory of architecture from the Delft University of Technology, and he is an assistant professor at the UIC School of Architecture in Chicago. He is a founding member of the research collective, The City as a Project, the think tank Behemoth Press, and Matteo Manini Architects. So Kate, perhaps we could begin this conversation uh, with you. Your text for Manifest, Knowing What the Mountain Knows, is uh, really a wonderful musing that traces a certain kinship between nature writers. It retraces the footsteps of Henry David Thoreau, Aldo Leopold, Lauren Eisley, and Annie Dillard, as they make small observations about their encounters with the outside world and turn them into propositions about the relationship between human and non-human temporalities. Uh, so I want to ask uh, time, uh, you know, the concept of time is in a way uh, such a meaningful yet elusive concept in your text. Um, and I wanted to ask you about it. What is your take on the relationship between time spent observing and time spent writing? Dan, thank you. That is, um, time is an elusive concept for all of these authors. Um, and it provokes some really interesting questions that they grapple with. How is it measured? How does it impact what you see? Is it related to the way you live your life, to knowledge? And none of them 
I would argue, um, separate these provoking questions from the act of observation. And Thoreau makes this explicit in the essay Walking, where he argues that observation be, should be done all the time. But he also qualifies this statement by distinguishing between two types of observation. One type involved reading, and it led to academic and scholarly knowledge. And Thoreau was trained in this approach. He was well-read, educated at Harvard, and knowledgeable in philosophy, science, mathematics, the classics, and religion. But he was dismissive of this way of seeing and knowing and claimed he only did it intermittently. It was only an intermittent pursuit for him. And what he said he was really after and hoped to advance through his actions in writing was a type of inter observation that involved direct engagement with the world. It's rocks and soils, it's plants and animals and it's daily and seasonal cycles. And he felt that this type of knowledge was more fundamental and true to life than any type of law or abstraction people could think of. And he positioned it in opposition to the cleverness of an artist. Walden, um, when he moves to the cabin and he positions, he, he positions this type of observation as a simplification of life that clarified and enriched his thought. And when he was there, he gloried in the fact that he could sit quietly outside the door of his cabin uh, for and a whole morning would pass without interruption. Um, and he also claimed that this, this type of knowing freed people from the bounds of laws and constraints that they didn't even know held them in place. And he justified this claim by stating his fellow townsmen who inherited farms and houses and cattle and farm equipment and farming tools would be better off if they had been, and I quote here, born in an open pasture and suckled by a wolf that they might have seen with clearer eyes what field they were called to labor in. Now, Annie Dillard, who wrote Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek in kind of an homage and dialogue with um, Thoreau, positions it this way in her essay, The Writing Life. Um, and she says, quote, and I quote here, writers were made and set here to give voice to this, your own astonishment. And to capture this in words requires the discipline to work steadfastly along the nerve of one's own most innate sensitivity or she continues as Thoreau put it, pursue and keep up with it, circle around and around your life, know your own bone, gnaw at it, bury it, unearth it and gnaw at it still. And so when I was thinking about these different environmental writers and how they wrote and how they observed, I tried to capture this and also this generation spanning conversation that they had as they grappled with what this way of seeing, knowing, and writing meant for them, their lives, and how they observed and lived in the world. And in each case, they discovered the difficulties and entails, the loneliness, the hard work, as they circled around and nod an idea. But during the process, they also, and I think that this is what was really interesting and fascinating to me, they borrowed, assembled, reassembled observations, memories, and meanings into new languages of discovery that was true to themselves and to the particulars of the landscape they inherited, but it made you look at it as if for the first time and with new eyes. And for each of them, this exercise clearly entwined people, place, identity, and representation. And as such, it allowed them to probe the, ten the tension between time, observation, meaning, truth, and insight. Thanks for, for that answer. I think it, it also uh, leads me to the next question, which is uh, the different scale of time that is perhaps more uh, close to the, to the sort of central uh, theme of today's, which is uh, geological time. And it seems that sort of immense slowness of certain phenomena that these writers uh, were observing was key in the shaping of some of the most valuable observations, right? So I think you're, of, uh, of course, of Leopold's haunting concept of thinking like a mountain, sort of going out of your head or out of any human's head completely to to become something else and and see see the world through its eyes 
and of course, Isley's uh, drift along the river, which allows him to reconnect with the, uh, the eons of the that mountains and desert snow, as he calls it. Can you speculate on the role of this idea of uh, extreme slowness in the work of nature writers and American ones and specifically? Yes, and again, you know, this is a really interesting question, you know, trying to grapple with it and, and to think about it. Um, and I'm going to turn to their writing and what they, what they did and how they did it. And one of the things, again, is how they were able to achieve it in a sparseness of language. Thinking Like a Mountain was only two pages of all of the Sand County Almanac, and, and the first page really captures this idea of slowness, but it begins with the first sentence when he describes the, the cry of a wolf. And it's a haunting passage that every time I read it, it makes me really think about this time and slowness and what it means. And I'm going to read this, quote this sentence for you, and it begins, a deep chesty ball echoes from rim rock to rim rock, rolls down the mountain and fades into the far blackness of the night. Now, what is intriguing here is that this sound is momentary. It's a cry, but it echoes and it reverberates as it moves from rim rock to rim rock and it passes, as he says, into the blackness of night. So from the light of day to the darkness of night, and then it comes to rest in the rest of the essay in the long span of geologic time. Now, I would argue that this type of writing is not unique to American nature writers. Nature writers from around the world have captured this and captured it beautifully. But what this is and the language he uses makes it specific to place. What marks this story as part of the Western landscape of the United States is the scale of the human body in this vast space. The rugged cliff face and the vernacular cowboy term rim rock that he uses to describe it. The dry air that carries a sound like that when you're there and the, and the lack of vegetation that makes these echoes really strong and reverberation. And so in this landscape, the body is fully exposed and alone. And he knew that he experienced it. Well, and he described it as being a speck on the crest of a ridge. And there are few places left in the world where you can experience this feeling. And Leopold makes the most of it by asking you to imagine that haunting call and the attendant fear it conjures. And then he ups the ante, you know, it's, it's, it's really fun by asking you to imagine it at night. And then he takes you deeper into the particulars of the landscape by calling attention to the little sounds of the horse's hoofs against the stone the indigenous plants that have distinctive smells like sage and juniper. So then there's smell there that evokes this landscape. So it's this combination of scale and sound and language and smell that situates this landscape within the American, you know, the, the Southwest of the United States. And, you know, we've all experienced this in our own travels. Every landscape has its distinctive vegetation, every ridge line, its different contours and colors because of the vegetation, the humidity and the color of light, the smells are unique. And so the writers that I discussed made the most of this and they used it, as you say, to take a person outside themselves and away from their daily routine. And then, you know, moving quickly to Isley, there's the vastness of the sky in the American Midwest that he saw when he lay down on his back adrift in the Platte River. And I'm going to quote this passage, which didn't make it into the essay, but I think it really captures what you mean about how you can move outside yourself, but also internalize what you feel um, inside your body. And so when he, when he lay down, he, he wrote, and I quote, the sky wheeled over me for an instant as I bobbed into the main channel, I had the sensation of sliding down the vast tilted face of the continent. It was then I felt the cold needles of alpine springs at my fingertips and the warmth of the Gulf pushing me southward, moving with me, leaving its taste in my mouth and spouting under me and dancing springs of sand was the immense body of the continent itself, flowing like the river was flowing, grain by grain, mountain by mountain down to the sea, unquote. 
And again, what an amazing way to describe the life of the earth. And I think that that starts to get to this notion of slowness and the body and its relation to geologic time. Thank you. And I think in, in that case, which I reread as well, the, the full text of, uh, of Eisley's text is, is really uh, uh, so close to poetry as well, right? So I think mm -hmm. the, the power of language here really takes you into the, the, um, this experience that is so uh, uh, familiar and so uh, strange at the same time. Uh, perhaps I want to uh, Francesco to uh, ask some questions if he's uh, ready. Sure. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Kate, for your uh, great essay. I really enjoyed reading it. And uh, yes, just a couple of questions. Uh, uh, the first one is, um, yeah, drawing from the, uh, from Thoreau, Leopold, Isley, uh, you know, meditations on the magnitude of the earth, uh, and also the important lesson you were just mentioning about learning back how to see things. Uh, I was wondering how we can, you know, learn from these lessons and re-elaborate or eventually dismantle the idea of individualism and from that conjecture a new way of uh, inhabiting and dwelling the world, uh, perhaps, you know, in a non-anthropocentric way, if you can say that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that this is um, really, again, another interesting question and to answer this, I'm going to like pivot away from actually what these writers wrote in these essays to something, um, I'll begin with Leopold that he wrote in the concluding chapters of the Sand County Almanac. And, and this discourse, when you think about habitation and home and, and being in a place, in what that means. It's, it's about the carrying capacity of the land and its ability to provide the goods and services we need. So, you know, th this one passage in the San Connie Almanac was very poetic, but then he moves to fairly straightforward rules and ideas and concepts of how you would, would live in the world in a non-anthropocentric way and in a commensurate way. Um, and so he equates living commensurately with the world. And I, and I bring this up because I think it jives with what Lydia was thinking about with the soil um, and its response to disturbance. So he talks about how certain soils can take a lot of disturbance. And he example, he talks about the soils of Europe and that they were farmed for a long time, but they still maintain a certain amount of fertility and then they can respond back. They're resilient to this disturbance. In Western Virginia and Kentucky where Annie Dillard wrote Tinker's Creek is similar. That's the bluegrass region of the United States. Well, even though the cattle were grazing there and the dirt bikes had destroyed the land, it could re, um, bounce back from this resilience and maintain some type of integrity. But when Leopold talked about the land and thinking like a mountain, when he was in the dry southwest of the United States, where very thin soils, little water, um, very f not much vegetation, and therefore not much organic matter or fertility. When the wolf is killed in that passage, the mother wolf, um, a, a tipping point is reached and it upends this balance of nature because this predator was killed, the deer and the sheep multiply, they eat every edible bush and seedling, and then they starve and they're dead. And from and I like this passage um, from their own too much. And their bones lie in the sun and they bleach with the bones of the dead sage. And the bare soil of the mountain erodes, loses its natural fertility, and eventually even the mountain dies. And so what the mountain fears there is not the wolf, but the human. Um, and then to explain what he means, Leopold then envisions the land as a circuit or flow of energy. And it begins with the sun, it moves through the soil and the water and into the plants, and then up through the tropic levels of the food chain to the herbivores and the primary secondary predators. And it maintains this pyramid or structure. Um, and so this energy flow from the sun through plants in the soil and in the air, up through the food chain to the animals was really important. 
And if it was disrupted or shortened, then the chain was destroyed and the energy flow is shortened and the land is diminished. And this was really very important to Leopold. Um, many landscape architects and environmental writers in the mid 20th century read it. And if we kind of go even deeper into this thicket of environmental and landscape design. Someone that I've written about, Ian McCarg, read Leopold, um, and he has notebooks and notebook pages underlined of, of, of passages from the Sand County Almanac and about these energy circuits. And so when he wrote this planning manifesto, Design with Nature, he depicted this relationship on the front cover of the first edition as an image of the sun on one side and the earth on the other. And so by doing this, he transformed this ecological energy flow, this community dynamic into a paradigm that operated at the scale of the whole earth. And so he doesn't just make this region or the hut or whatever the habitation, but it's the whole earth. And so, you know, I want to open it up to um, you all to think a little bit more about this and the fundamental symbol here. Is it the hut in the home or the habitation, or is it the green leaf and its ability to capture the energy of the sun? It's beautiful. Um, <laughs> yes, I've, I've been very much attracted by also the way you, I mean, all those others, but somehow use to convey their personal experience to somehow uh, exceed their individuality and their, you know, the limits of the individuality in order to somehow almost uh, dissolve themselves into, you know, the environment, almost in a sort of oceanic feeling to, you know, to, to you know, just to use a Freudian terminology. Uh, maybe a second question is that, since you mentioned the hut and the cabin, uh, more related to Toro's, uh, uh, I know it might sound silly, but you know, from the architecture school, I would like to maybe you know, introduce the architecture as you know as a theme for the second question. So um, I was wondering about you know uh, you know Toro uh, uh, conscious and deliberate decision to uh, you know to separate uh, temporarily from society uh, is actually activated by constructing building himself his own cabin on the Walden Pond, uh, and it's curious uh, that uh, it's also an experience that has been somehow common by, you know, or shared that he shared with other intellectuals, uh, other intellectuals, for example, Victor Stein, uh, you know, was, you know, uh, constructed his own cabin in the middle of the fjords in Norway, or uh, uh, Le Corbusier uh, spent his last days on a cabin on, on the sea, or even the controversial figure uh, we, we've been you know, we've been talking about uh, Ted Kaczynski, you know, the mathematician that uh, rec secreted himself in Montana before starting, you know, before elaborating his uh, terroristic attack. So somehow uh, people that decide that deliberately chosen to seclude themselves from society, but in order to, you know, uh, elaborate uh, a, a critic, a strong critic on society as, as, as such. But what I would I like to focus on, the, on my question is, uh, you know how architecture itself can help, can, sorry, can help and support the construction of a you know critical, spiritual, or intellectual distance and critical distance from society, and uh, and there again, like my previous question, also conjecture or envision a different form of living, a, a form of living that is uh, mostly collective and not based on let's say individual possessions or commodities or let's say subjectivity. I think, I think that's a very interesting question. And, and I will admit that one is harder to me because I usually think about community and position those ideas outside of architecture, uh, not completely because I, as a landscape architect, I've spent most of my life uh, living and working in urban conditions and those ideas. But I think that there's some more parceling that we need to do here. Um, so yes, this notion of simplifying your surroundings um, and living with the deeper engagement with the natural world resonates. It resonates across countries, it resonates across time, um, and it particularly in the modern age, it's, it's very important. Thoreau again felt that that was one thing that allowed him to step outside of himself and be a part and parcel of nature. He was 
just as e easily though entranced by moving all of his furniture outside, putting a tarp up and living under that tarp. And so he, he starts to really even dissolve that boundary even further um, or even does it have to be of constructed or man-made materials? I, I, so I think that having that critical distance is really integral and important and something that architects need to think about the economy of means, scale and size. I would, again, I step back a little bit because I do have some trouble equating Thoreau to um, Le Corbusier or his hut for one thing, because I think it would have been too artistic or too much of culture for him, for what he wanted to do with the hut. And, and, and I state this because I'm thinking about some other you know, terms and words he read when he would walk through town on his way to his hut and he would pass homes, he equated the smells to slaughterhouses. And, and so it's, again, I think it's this idea of architecture maybe as an entrapment. Um, and, and I'm going to punt and not go as far as Ted Kaczynski. I know there's a streak of libertarian democracy there, but um, I personally don't know if I can, I put, if I put Thoreau on a, a airport runway, but I'm not sure I could put him in a Unabomber hut. So, I mean, but I think it's fascinating to think about that because if you take it to its logical extreme, that's where you go. Yes, I mean, uh, um, concerning Thoreau, I, I, Yes, I, I was simply asking this question because uh, the part of the construct, I mean, architecture is not conceived as an antagonist, uh, you know, to the environment. It is actually part of the human kind, of the human species, like other animals construct their own, you know, uh, you know uh, inhabitations, uh, so humans do. And therefore, if you do that in a specific way, you know, if you do that somehow responding or in a, in, let's say, in a balanced way to, to the surrounding, you know, this is part of our way of being in the world, it's part of the dwelling. And it's, I mean, it's interesting that, I don't know, Heidegger was writing, you know, uh, is dwelling peace on a cabin in the black uh, forest, or, uh, you know, Wittgenstein was thinking about the limits of language on a, in a cabin in, in Norway. So, I mean, I was simply, you know, attracted by the fact, and not me, but also other, other people wrote even about these uh, similarities, but, by the fact that you know, by uh, uh, deliberately secluding yourself into a very minimal space, a space where you can oh, even build yourself, and, and 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 a space that where where in which you can breathe together with the surrounding, somehow uh, you know the the, the you know the, there is a there is a tendency you know to reelaborate your position in the in the world, and also the way you produce is a. Uh, is immediately affected by the, the space where your body is positioned and where your body, you know, negotiate with with the, with the environment. So that 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 was my, you know, the the key uh, of, of of my, you know, of, of my question. Because somebody, oh, often those people are, you know, considered simply, you know, people that abandon society almost to almost in, in an antagonistic way. But actually, they did it. Uh, you know, first of all, they were not so far from society. You know, the Walden Pond is not so far from uh from you know uh, uh, villages but in, in general what i'm trying to say is that they deliberately uh, accepted the solitude and the seclusion in order to elaborate a new form or, or challenge a new form of society but without you know some of these regarding uh you know the the social yeah you know, the social relationships uh yeah well no I, I again and i think that's really interesting and i think materiality is really important and a play here and again i'm i'm thinking of other uh, landscape architects who discussed this. And again, so for someone like um, Thoreau, he was using the materials of place. There was timber that he could cut down and build his home and it was right there. And so that was a real economy of means. He didn't build it from something that he had to import. Or if I think about Ian McCarg, which was also really interesting because there's, there's strong linkages here. There's passages in Design with Nature where he quotes uh, the ecologist Paul Sears about nest and nest building, you know, and so if you spoil your nest, 
you know, you spoil your own home. But one of the things that's really intriguing in there is he calls attention to the fact that animals are building nests and constructing the homes. And he points out the Nautilus shell that Le Corbusier used. Um, he pulls that out from his text to illustrate that. Um, and then he then says, well, what have architects built with an economy of means and materials that are uh, in, in sympathy with their surroundings. And it was trendy at the time, but he pulls out the Pueblo of Taos, New Mexico, as just a, a mountain in and of itself building up and from that, that uh, landscape. He also points to falling water. Um, so again, it's embedded in nature, in, in this landscape, using the materials, or Lawrence Halperin, thinking uh, about the sea ranch and how the different uh, buildings there mimic the you work with the wind or mimic it. So I think that this, what you're uh, describing is a um, really strong vein in both landscape architecture and architecture. And then on a more humorous note, when Annie Dillard decided to live in a cabin, she just basically got a, a prefab garden hut from Lowe's. So, you know, so I think, it, I think you know, it's, it's also really interesting to think about how other you know, how you can play with those ideas and things like that. So I don't think there is a separation, but I think it's, again, scale, size, materials, economy. Yeah, maybe if I can, I just, I'm not sure, Dan, if I'm, uh, if I can just simply add up one more point is that, yeah, I found a lot of affinities also with my work and, for example, interest in asceticism. Somehow asceticism has always been considered as a way to, you know, as a, you know, seeking refuge, a way, from society, whereas asceticism, you know, even etymologically means to exercise upon yourself, like exercise upon your, you know, uh, labor power or capacities of your own body, you know, to react to and negotiate with the environment and in, in by somehow uh, achieving knowledge uh, and increasing knowledge about yourself, you know, like uh, being able to expand your own power, you know, almost a Spinoza, Spinozian way, like expanding the common notions, expanding the connections. And so, and only, this is only possible by going through your own individuality, but paradoxically in order to dismantle your own individuality. So that's why I found it extremely, extremely interesting. I would just add to that before we move to Lydia that I think it's an interesting point. You know, the primitive heart and this whole myth of the beginning of architecture that, you know, all of these hearts in a way echo. Uh, but I think it's interesting in, in today's conversation, perhaps we could talk about that a little bit later to conceive of the, the heart, not only as the sort of point of beginning, right? You build your hut, it's finished, then you do your project, like a Wittgenstein thing, um, but rather it's something that exists over a very long period of time. So it's, it, it almost like melts. So that's why I think your, uh, uh, your example, the, the sort of uh, uh, going out to the desert for religious and spiritual uh, reasons, I think is maybe an even more interesting idea, right? So how you sort of uh, go build your thing or inhabit your thing and then you stay there for the rest of your life basically right and this enhances a certain uh, sense of time that I think perhaps is more uh, you know it's closer to what uh, some of these writers that Kate was describing uh, were talking about. Can I respond or uh, <laughs> it is also true that the desert uh, encourages you, you know, almost like two kinds of settlements. Uh, one is, you know, trying to find refuge into the natural elements themselves. Uh, but the other one is also a way, a totally different way of inhabiting the, the earth, which is basically, you know, if you want the nomadic way of, uh, uh, you know, supporting life, which is not, you know, it's made of points and trajectories rather than owing lands and owing let's say, uh, estates or framing the earth in a more possessive way. So moving from ownership to uses and to, you know, sensuality to, let's say, movements. Uh, I mean, we can discuss about this later, but it's interesting that although I'm talking about almost like, you know, looking at remote images of nomads, I mean, there are many, nomadic life is still pretty active, but actually capitalism is forcing today to, you know, to, you know, to uh, endorse and, you know, and, and, and you know, uh, uh, let's say, encourage us to actually be more nomadic, and more you know. And all of us have been traveling for work or for and displaced for in many other reasons. So somehow, you know, the desert is not such a remote image, but is actually present more than we think. 
uh, we can leave this for later. Uh, well, I, I think all of that sets up very nicely then to speak about your work, Lydia, where if we're shifting to uh, knowing what the mountain knows, in a way your work is very much about making the mountain know and the kind of afterlife uh, that, uh, that human beings uh, through uh, some of, as we'll talk about, the most uh, monumental and catastrophically enduring achievements very deep in the desert in the form of nuclear waste sites because I think your contribution is this wild speculative text about this very unhappy yet monumental and as I've just mentioned catastrophic uh, set of achievements uh, which is to say nuclear waste sites um, and in particular though you you take a very different way of looking at this which is from the perspective of future archaeologists and so I think it weaves really beautifully scientific and cultural observations and uses this estrangement technique as a way to critically look at our present condition. So thinking about uh, your work in, in that way and these future archeologists, could you say a few words about the role of time in shaping of ideas of both archeology span and that genre often referred to as scientific discovery? Uh, thank you, Anthony, and thanks, Dan and Manifest, for having me here tonight. And um, I love the way that you framed it, you know, um, in relative to also uh, Kathleen's text that, yeah, it's about making the mountain know. Um, and I'm also glad that um, you're asking this question about um, archaeology and scientific discovery because it also allows me to make a distinction between geology, archeology span and, and science. And also just first of all, for our audience today, I'm not a geologist nor a scientist. And uh, I look at these fields in an expanded way and also as inspiration. And um, just there's this, this great text by the artist Robert Smithson that's titled A Crystal Land. And um, after he goes on to describe the, the various minerals that he encounters in the quarry, I believe in New Jersey, then he moves on to start describing the highways. And what he writes is that, you know, the highways uh, crisscross through the towns and then they become my geological networks of concrete. So um, this reading uh, was fascinating to me of, you know, a concrete infrastructure as a geological network. And of course, he's, he's, he's interested in these shared mineral qualities that the quarry has, but also the concrete has. And um, I, I'm personally drawn to this concept of a man-made geology, perhaps more so than the one of archaeology. And the, the text is really using geology uh, to make, uh, and the drawings that I did for, for the journal, uh, to form this hypothesis, which is, what does it really mean if we were to think about these composite environments? Because they are man-made spaces, which are hidden in some very specific geologies. So what does it mean to think about them as fossils? And that, that gives me the way and the tools to critically examine them in a different way. Um, so the concept of a geological formation um, is, is helping to unpack those spaces relative to materiality and relative to time. And uh, the text title, Future Fossils, has a twofold take on, on the concept of time. The first one is that these environments involve a geologic process that takes a very long time to form. But secondly, and that's something that's, that's explored um, more in the drawings, if you want to show them. Um, in, in that respect, the object, uh, which is um, the repository of nuclear waste, is an imprint of a moment, uh, of a moment in time, but it's, a, it's an imprint in a rock, right? This is also what a, a traditional fossil is. Uh, but, but it's also an imprint of an event. And in, in fossils, uh, the organism died, so the leaf has left its trace, or the mammoth tooth uh, became stone and the mammoth uh, got extinct. So, 
by looking at geology, I think allows me to to talk about time uh, and process of formation of matter in time. Your, your, your answer also reminds me, uh, Lydia, of how we, we met at a school of architecture that actually was the outgrowth of a department of art history and archeology. span um, And I, I very much appreciate this kind of uh, human made uh, geology uh, and geological uh, potentially kind of ruin. And in building upon that and thinking about uh, your, your piece, I was reminded when uh, reading your description of the WIPP in New Mexico, where a mammoth salt mass becomes the perfect site for waste storage. I couldn't help but think of say the, the descriptions of the pyramids by uh, British and French travelers, or even uh, Van Danken's uh, kind of chariots of the gods. And so I was wondering, do you see this iconic, uh, uncanny kind of quality of such project as something that is inherent to the creation of their future deciphering? And of course, that future deciphering suggests also a subject there, meaning who might do the future deciphering of these sites, the, the afterlife of these sites? Um. I think this is a great question and also how you set up the, the parallel to the pyramid because the, the pyramid is this uh, object of immense scale, right? That's devoted to uh, burial. And uh, the sites that I'm writing about are also devoted to a burial, uh, but it's not of a human uh, matter, but it's rather of uh, radioactive waste matter. Um, so they, they, they certainly share this kind of monumentality and the idea that something is resting there till the end of time, right? And whoever constructs them is scripting this end of time. Um, and if, we, if we're also to think about it linguistically and in terms of time, in the pyramid, there is the concept of the afterlife uh, in the burial uh, and in the nuclear waste storage facility, there is a half time of the radioactive isotopes. And I, I find these kind of word, word games always very interesting because we're talking about half lives and they are thousands and thousands of years. So, you know, what, what does it mean really a half life? But, but another reason why I like this parallel is that um, salt, which is one of the sites that I write about, is a salt dome. Um, salt in ancient culture has, has been used as a way to preserve food. So it was also the, the medium to support life, right? Um, and here salt becomes again a, a medium for preservation but it's really to protect life above from what it's being preserved. So um, to go back to, to geology and to time, there is the, this principle that uh, Nicola Steno created um, in his stratigraphy theory back when they were thinking how Earth is really composed. And it was that uh, uniform layers can tell a specific story about the Earth. But then he also explained that there is this principle of angular discontinuity. And what this principle says is that if stratigraphy layers, the layers of Earth are not uniform, it means something is out of place and uh, that some event happened. So there is an anomaly. And uh, so in, in my writing, these radioactive isotopes that are found in this very crystalline salt or this lava stone, they are really an anomaly in, in geologic terms because they, they're completely out of place. They, they don't belong there as matter. And uh, so they are this discontinuity. Um, and I, I like how you, 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 you set it up as this idea of estrangement, you know, because one can only imagine discovering the pyramids in the desert, this object, right? And this idea of discovering these, these vast spaces inside salt or inside lava. So yeah, there's, there's very much of that there. And, and just to follow up very briefly on that really wonderful um, explanation you gave, Lydia, I, I also can't help but think of 
when we're talking about pyramids, chariots of the gods, right, of like trying to develop almost origin stories of say, you know, Hal Foster's prosthetic gods of the ways in which uh, certain individuals or communities need to, you know, construct or develop origin stories. So I'm curious, how do you imagine someone you know, in the, in the half-life, is this kind of like a Ridley Scott Prometheus where they arrive and then all of a sudden, right, like something looks kind of cute and attacks, uh, right, the, the, the astronauts? Or I'm curious if you could hallucinate just a little bit more on what do you imagine that encounter might be like? I should have inhaled more like uh, fumes from a site that I was a couple of weeks ago to answer this. But um, so, um, you know, there, there's, of course, a whole science behind this and Umberto Eco has done work on that, how you can write signs that can warn someone in thousands of years ago when the absence of the language as we know it um, you know, uh, is, is not there. So how can you warn future generations? So there's a whole like linguistic study that I'm not even going to go there. But all, all I can say in a quasi hallucinatory way is um, I am interested in this concept like of assemblies of matter. And um, I guess the text is really all about stratification, right? So um, there is this um, idea that you have the, the salt or you have the lava, and then at one point you penetrate it and you encounter this really, what they are today, very high tech. I would imagine if they were to be encountered in the deep time, they're not so high tech anymore. Um, but right now they are basically as close to, you know, a very sealed uh, envelope that we can produce. So um, I, I'm interested in the element of surprise, you know, that you have these two very different uh, surfaces and assemblies meeting together. Um, and then going further deep into the tunnels and finding the containers and inside the containers, there's this, of course, something else. So it's really like peeling, peeling away. Thanks, and I think that sets up nicely. Uh, Francesco, do you have some questions? Sure, yes, thank you, Lydia. It was really an incredible piece. I, yes, I, I read it and enjoyed it a lot. And, um, I also share with you the sympathies and affinities with Robert Smithson work. And so, yeah, just a couple of questions maybe inspired by that reference. Um, so yeah, the main thesis of the, the essay is basically that, you know, the fossils are not simply, it's not simply something buried in the ground. It's not an object or a trace of, a, of the past of a past existence, but which could actually can be animal, vegetable, or even mineral. But it is actually the entirety of the earth so it's a vast uh, archive, a temporal material archive, we, which you know, we are constantly contributing to you know, inhabiting and expanding it by means of our life, by means of our activities, including architecture. So somehow what, what you define as the incident of the nuclear uh, residue, you know, residues, it's also produced at a smaller scale by architecture every day. So I'm wondering how can uh, some architecture you know, learn from you know the deep time and the you know the magnitude of the time and how can you know learn to reframe our tools once we consider architecture this miserable activity within the magnitude of you know this uh, open air museum uh, which is the earth itself. Uh, thanks so much, Francesco. Um, I'm I'm also a practicing architect, so I think your question is one that I ask myself a lot and maybe one that keeps me up at night. <laughs> uh, you know, what does it really mean to build, right? And um, I, how do you engage this temporal dimension? And I would say at least uh, I, in my own work, I'm trying to find an answer for this uh, through the, the capacity of matter to tell a story. And uh, is, it, is it really a story of extraction? And do we want to keep telling that story? 
right? Or do we want to move away from that story? Um, would it be a story about how things are put together and why are they put together in that particular way? Uh, is it a story of a process? And if it is, then can matter also tell a cultural uh, history? Um, I'm also very interested in, in the degradation of matter, uh, one that goes, I would say, beyond weathering, but rather how things start fall apart after some time. Like, for instance, um, in my research, I, I've also looked at how pollution can eat away stone, for instance. So what does it mean to consciously build something out of stone in a very polluted environment, right? Where the sulfur dioxide is gonna start eating the limestone after a number of years. So, um, so and I'm also you know, engaged with processes of extraction, but also I'm interested in byproducts. So to maybe finally go to your question, how do we, also produce, how does architecture can produce an idea about the future? And um, I have to think like of um, something that um, the political scientist, uh, Joan Toronto uh, had written. And she, she speaks that rather that thinking of uh, buildings as things, uh, to think of them in relationships uh, with ongoing environments, with uh, people, with flora and fauna uh, that exist through time as well as in space. And that would change the approach fundamentally. And, and to me, this, this kind of thinking embodies many of the values that I would like to have as an architect and that architecture should respond to today because it doesn't just engage the past or the present, but it also engages the future all in a kind of a continuum. Um, and in that respect, it's not just about the building as a singular object, but rather how it's tied to a range of animate and non-animate forces around it and how this assemblage of, of things can also change through time. If that answers, I try. Oh, yes, I, 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 I really appreciate your point, especially on the building construction. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, especially today where, you know, the activity of architecture, the, the impact of architecture on the planet has been seriously reconsidered and criticized. You know, it feels that building is becoming, uh, you know, a, you know a, 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 a very almost regretful uh, activity. And so, of course, it depends how you do it, right? And what are the, you know, the meanings and the, you know, the, that you are assigned to the operations. And for example, your point on the material is extremely interesting to me, especially in a moment where materials are often aestheticized or simply, you know, considered for purely, you know, uh, uh, aesthetic reasons or purposes, especially the use of stones. Uh, you know, in the past decades, there are mostly a lot of uh, attempts to, you know, uh, recover primitive assemblages or uses of stones which are which is decorative, or you know, purely for support, but you know, simply as boulders that uh, I don't know don't really have any association for with the stone itself, but simply you know they, they become a sort of collage or uh, let's say a, a, a almost like a, yeah an assemblage, uh, but not the assemblage where how you are intending it, but a purely, you know, compositive assembly. Yeah, this leads me to, 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 the, to the other question that I had. And, and I, I like this a lot, you know, building on what Anthony was saying, you know, uh, so usually uh, we think about, I mean, the, the, today another very uh, violently attacked category is the category of the monument. And usually you think about a monument, uh, you know, as something to remember the past, you know, something to actually, as a way to, you know, to isolate a specific narration of the past. And that's why monuments are currently criticized and, you know, uh, uh, statues are overthrown and, in, in, and rightly overthrown. But, uh, but th this is a very interesting, you know, uh, uh, understanding of the very traditional understanding of the monument, very anthropic understanding of the monument, right? It's something that relates to a past, whereas Mitson, but also your ruins, uh, seems to somehow, uh, you know, like unfold another understanding of the monument, a monument that uh, is not uh, oriented towards the past, but actually towards the future. But it's a future that they try also to destroy or to uh, slow down, almost to forget the future. In other words, it's, uh, you know, they are preserving this armful debris 
in order to, you know, uh, you know, uh, somehow they responsabilize their activity, but also, you know, to push them in the future, almost as a, you know, as a, as something that can be projected in order to not harm the present. So somehow the future is decaying or is uh, annihilated in an endless present in order to preserve an endless present. So I'm wondering again, what's your point or is there a new monumentality that you want to think about? Or is there a new, you know, a way to reconfigure or to reconsider monumentality away from the models that have been, you know, the traditional models that have been, so far they've been somehow conjectured. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I was also thinking is that, you know, back before, um, you know, um, mankind managed to get to the moon, um, going to the moon was considered to be, let's say, the most further point of technology that we could think about, right? And, um, you know, then you have like uh, Noguchi writing that we finally go to the moon and what do we find to bring back? We bring rocks, right? Uh, this is a specimen that we bring. And then um, with these sites, we've managed to, you know, split the atom and um, create all these processes and energy. But there is this shameful uh, thing that we still haven't managed to dispose of or do something with it. So what do we do? We find the most peculiar rocks again, uh, rocks that have certain properties, uh, thermal insulating properties in the middle of deserts, and that's where we put it. So um, to me, kind of like the, the thread between all, this, all these things is the geology. It is the stone in the end, uh, because it's, it's the thing that will, will, will remain. And it's for this precise reason that we both collect it to learn from it when we go to the moon, because it can tell us what happened uh, back to thousands and millions of years ago but it's also what will stay there in the future. And there's something, you know, to me, that's the, the most, let's say, monumental thing about it all. Um, that is, has both to do with time, but also with, with endurance. Perhaps I could ask something that's related to that. And it's also, uh, I think in a way, it connects uh, the two texts that we're discussing today, which is the fossil. So of course, in your text, Lydia, the fossil is very present, um, but I'm kind of, when hearing Francesco's questions and your answers, I'm kind of thinking of the fossil not only as the, as the physical scientific uh, uh, artifact, uh, but as something, you know, in a way it's a sort of uh, material compressed by time, right? So I'm kind of thinking uh, of uh, Emerson saying, um, you know, talking about this sort of uh, concept of uh, language as uh, fossil poetry, right? That certain uh, poetic origins are sort of degrading, uh, almost in the same way that you described when you were talking about the degradation of materials. Uh, so certain uh, origins, tropes are degrading and then they become uh, uh, original, uh, not original, uh, uh, like ordinary language, right? So I was kind of wondering, uh, this is for the two of you, I guess. Um, could you speak of this idea of the fossil as something, as a connector uh, of material and language? Um, would you like to go first? Uh, um, oh, okay. Well, I, you know, I, I was just fascinating, Lydia, just listening to you speak. And, and the thing that I'm, you know, I'm puzzling over, I'm gnawing the bone that I'm gnawing, um, as, as I think about this, is that what you talk about is so unnatural and yet so natural. Radioactivity, the sun, you know, we wouldn't be here without that. And yet at the same time, it becomes something that's so toxic to us and the way we've used it. And then also to think about the objects that are encased 
in your salt dome sealed by this salt that's that's malleable are just so mundane you know you talked about gloves and 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 other little waste products from hospitals from power plants things like that and so what what is really interesting is this fossil as the archaeologic trace but also thinking about the landscape and the rocks it contains as having their own inherent radioactivity and their own trace. You know, so if you get a certain kind of granite countertop, you can, you know, this happens to you. Or, you know, I'm taking it, I'm trying to think about this as a fossil in a way or a fossil of society. Um, because there was one experience that um, I, that I had in my life that was truly amazing. So I had a very good friend who was the head of the, I was on the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And she um, was called to the port of Newark. And this was uh, shortly a year or two after, you know, 10 years after Chernobyl. And there was a container that came into the port of Newark and it was highly radioactive. And so they didn't know if it was a bomb, weapons, what, what, what it was going. So they opened the container and it was Ikea birchwood furniture. And the trees had taken up the radioactivity and they had then come to the United States and been distributed in everyone's home. So of course we all got our Geiger counter and checked our Ikea furniture to see if, you know, something that we thought of as these really simple uh, mundane objects were radioactive active and toxic. And so I think what I find fascinating about this is you, you're talking about how it's encased, but it's also our background noise. It's what we live in and what we inhabit. And so the distinction between it as the fossil and the world we live in itself as being radioactive as well, I find I find really fascinating, and I'm trying to parse that out. Particularly when you think about when you're talking about it as the scale of the Earth or the Earth itself um, being that archive, because there are bodies or places in the Earth that are inherently like what you're talking about, and so um, so is that we're mimicking and creating a fossil of what is there or is this fossil different? I don't know if I'm making sense, but I, I, I'm just finding this, this, this separation or non-separation or this interior or exterior or what's in us. Um, also, you know, children um, who grew up in the United States in particular um, in the 1950s, when the, the, the tests were going, have higher levels of strontium and other uh, radioactive materials within their bones. And so their fossils themselves are more radioactive. And so I, I'm finding um, your discussion of monumentality and nature and slow time really, really fascinating because it's just so, um, nebulous and ambiguous as well as distinct and placed. Um, thank you. It's really fascinating to hear your, your take on, on, on this reading that I had. And I, I'm going to try to um, express a couple of thoughts that I also had reading your text and your responses that may tie to this. And one has to do with this idea of the sublime and um, I it's a quick side story a year ago I moved to Switzerland which you know at least I had never been before moving there we all think about it as this sublime landscapes right and the first thing that I was given when I registered was a prescription for pills in case there's a nuclear accident so to me, this was one of the one of the strangest experiences I've had because you arrive in this country where 
you think it's one of the safest, you don't think about radioactivity or nuclear production at all, but that's the one of the first things you're asked to get from the pharmacy. So um, this is trying to tie it into, you know, kind of this idea of normalizing this in our everyday life, you know, from the IKEA furniture to, you know, uh, what our bodies carry and bodies of past generations or future generations carry. Um, and, and this idea of the sublime comes back because um, really uh, listening to your answers, you know, I was, uh, and uh, Dan, you mentioned uh, Emerson, you know, where nature for Emerson really has this sublime religious experience. And then Thoreau comes in and he changes that attitude to nature very much so, right? That it's not so much out there, but um, you, you're in it, right? And um, yeah, I just wanted to bring this idea of the sublime because it, it, it also speaks to some of the sites that I'm also writing about. You know, the Yucca Mountain is, is also like one of those sublime sites. And then here's what would be under it. So yeah, it's this idea of this monumental, this extreme beauty, but it's also frightening to you. And I think it ties some of these discussions perhaps. Um, would be curious to hear any responses also from you or from well, the thing the thing though that I that I also wonder so these are uh, the object that you talked about and, and you drew so beautifully and represented is buried underground and as you say the monument the mountain in some ways is the monument but or, but what if you don't, or you're not aware, or you, or through cultural uh, amnesia, you forget, or it just is no longer part of the culture. It's there. And so therefore, what then becomes of this monument? Does it then become integrated into the body of the earth itself? and not separate from. And that to me is, I think the ultimate question that your work poses for me. And then that ultimate question of, you know, how then do you define that sublime? Mm -hmm. And and if you're not aware of the that aspect of its terror, then what, what then, so. Mm -hmm. I'm opening up to everyone else, so <laughs> please feel free to uh, I just want to say something quickly. Uh, it's, it's interesting that Rainer Barnum in his book, uh, you know, Scenes of America Deserta, uh, tried to define the sublime of the desert experience. And precisely what you were saying, Lydia, you know, it doesn't, it, that Barnum doesn't define the, the, you know, the, I mean, sorry, the desert doesn't, somehow respond to the classical definition of the sublime, you know, a natural force that overwhelms your own powers, right? Uh, but it's something that is that shocks you because of the of the entropic dimension that it, it, it is, you know, uh, made of, meaning the, you know, the end of time and the collapse of time. Basically the desert, the pace of the desert is so slow that you are somehow part of it, but also you immediately feel uh, extremely miserable, but um, not simply specially, but more temporarily, in the sense that the, the desert that is in front of you is the result of a, 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 of a very long process, process of erasures and decay, and you are simply, you know, the you know, the just just the last fraction of a second in this uh, endless uh, uh, landscape that was before you and will be there after you uh, will pass away. So somehow it's interesting. There is this passage in the in the book where. It somehow attempts to define, the, redefine the concepts of the sublime, uh, moving from the from the desert experience. The other thing is about the monuments, like uh, Yucca, Yucca, you know, Yucca Mountain is a part, but there is also the the Yucca Flat and the and the Nevada, Nevada Test Site, which is the most bombed part of the planet, where I don't know how many uh, thousands of holes are being revealed and 
and also different because some of them were above the ground until 1963 and then after 1963 were below the ground and so they began, they began excavating like moles in order to in order to somehow blow up or attempt to blow up or yeah uh, yeah experiencing or testing ways to blowing up the planet and and uh, that landscape uh, I'm wondering is that how can we define that landscape is that um, again a new kind of monument or if a monument is something from the Latin root, you know, moneo means to remember, right? To remind and also to warn. Uh, so I'm wondering, like the statues that are overturned today, you know, the pedestals without the statues can be the yucca flat, you know, this plateau where there are no statues, but only bomb, you know, the, the residues of disasters can be considered monumental, you know, plateaus that somehow allude to you know, negative activities or activities that might harm our own, you know, uh, place on the earth or, or that somehow, yes, reveal our, you know, activities on the, on the, on the earth. Thanks, Francesca. I think it's a, it would be a great design studio to consider, right? I mean, not only design, but also sort of political project to, to sort of uncover these sites and, and think how they, they might be treated as uh, the monuments that one pushes down uh, rivers uh, these days. Um, I think perhaps uh, Jane and Fran Yeah, one, sorry. One, okay. quick, one quick thought on this though. One of the things though about the desert and you know we've all been in deserts when you're when you're there it's it's very much like being at the Arctic. When you're in it you know that this landscape can kill you. And the temp with just through temperature, um, and you can only survive in it for so long. And one of the things that we're doing with our activities is increasing that temperature. And and you know, there the predictions of the parts of the world that will no longer be inhabitable because they will just be too warm. And so I think this also plays into this because the locations that Lydia is talking about are in areas of the earth that may become so hot they're not inhabitable for people and so it's almost a monument or a marker of the fact that we can no longer inhabit a space and so that to me is also a, a real int intriguing ambiguity is it sorry if i jump in i mean i'm not I, it's this discussion is incredibly interesting i'm not really as a specialist in this field but it's an obsession now for me but uh you know, like we, you are talking from a, a human perspective, <laughs> you know, like for example, you know, animals reconquer the area of Chernobyl, like Chernobyl, when Chernobyl has been closed down after the disaster. Uh, today, you know, there are bio biologists and that they go there every day in order to study how animals and mushrooms and plants have reconquered that, that land. And like Lydia was saying, you know, a new strata has been formed, which is not only mineral, but it's of course vegetal, you know, and, and there is also animals life there. So life continues. And it's not even true that desert doesn't have life. Actually, the desert is composed by plants, animals, and ecosystems that are, you know, alive. Is that there are no human traces. And that, that's actually the most important, you know, reflection that the desert always communicates from Smithson to, to the Puebloan populations. I mean, talking about the American desert on, onward, is the fact that the desert has always been there and also be, always been populated in many sorts of forms through many kinds of architecture, more static, less static, more temporary, less temporary, underground or above the ground, but still it's about life and forms of energy. And I really love your point, Kathleen, that in the end, I don't, I don't think it's about stones, like Lydia's saying, I think it's, I mean, stone in the end is a certification of a point of energy. I think it's about levels of energy that we need to, and that geology brings us to think about. So the, the, the energy that can, you know, uh, solidify or may, may become concrete in different ways through the laws of thermodynamics. And might not, not by chance, you know, Smithson and many of the writers of the desert were inter interested in entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, but anyway, th this is a very long discussion, but I think it's a very beautiful research, Lydia, and, and i super fascinated by your uh, point of view. I'm looking forward to read more. <laughs> Thank and I, I think. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, go it's ahead. just uh, one last, um, perhaps like quick um, comment to Francesco. Yeah, it, it is 
energy. And I, I think this is also where I'm getting at that stone, even though it's perceived as a static object, it does embody all this energy and it does embody all these histories. That's why it is for me this fascinating specimen to unpack um, time. Yeah. And we, we have a few questions from the audience and I think it actually dovetails nicely with what we were just discussing, especially when Francesco uh, invoked, right, uh, non-human life, uh, which I think is also kind of circulating through all of the, the, the texts we're reading today. So we have, a, we have a question from Cody and a question from Sung, and maybe we'll start with the question from Sung because I think it relates to both uh, pieces uh, from Lydia and from, Kathleen and then shift to Cody. So the question from Sung has actually to do with uh, what things, and sorry, it's a rather long question, so I'm gonna to try to summarize it. But the, the question is, a, what, is it possible for uh, things, events, that are not necessarily physical to register within the geological? And here Sung is mentioning, uh, can we see a wolf's cry in the rim rock in geological terms? Is it possible for those things that are ephemeral to get caught uh, or to, uh, as evidence, as traces? And I think, again, traces was something that was coming up quite a bit. So what also escapes from these future monuments, future fossils of life that are not being captured, uh, maybe necessarily in material culture? So the song is then ending, are there then limits or blind spots to material culture? And then we have a question from Cody, uh, which is, uh, I think, directed primarily at Kathleen, that the mountain being fearful of the human, not the wolf, that's interesting. Does that suggest the human is not one of the land like the wolf? So no matter the setting, urban or rural, the human cannot have the wolf's relationship with nature? I I don't, um, well, those are both fascinating questions. Um, the physical trace on the rim rock. So the physical trace on the rim rock, I think is really fast, fascinating to think about. And it gives me real pause. And, and so, because it's such a wonderful question. The wolf's presence implies a specific type of environmental community and order that is dictated by the environment itself. In the story, Leopold and his hunting companion had were not part of that natural order when they shot the wolf. And so the trace that remains is not when the wolf is more is when the wolf dies and the landscape is destroyed. And so I, for Leopold, and that led to a whole series of, of thoughts for him, but the idea of the mountain fearing the wolf, um, that was, uh, you know, just a small throwaway line that Leopold put at the end. But again, it was like this question mark that made you stop and think in that we take ourselves. Um, it's, I think it gets back to the way Leopold um, and building upon Thoreau wanted people to step outside themselves, live in the moment and think instinctively to feel and understand that howl and that cry. And so that they would not be separate from. And, and what he was arguing is that the way we are taught the knowledge that Thoreau talked about as a scholastic or academic knowledge is not the valuable knowledge. It's not teaching us the right things. But if we step outside ourselves or immerse ourselves and learn to observe another type of landscape, then we learn a different type of knowledge that positions us more properly within 
that landscape. But the question that arises is, can that actually occur in the world today? Is that, is, is that a nostalgic, simplistic, romantic notion? Um, what are the nuts and bolts that allow that to happen? And so, so I think it's, it's really fascinating and it's, and it's tragic and in it's true. And so I, again, I just find these real, these really interesting questions because what is the blind spot? And, and that gets back to, I think what Lydia was talking about because by encasing this radioactivity in a salt dome in a mountain underneath, it's, it's creating a blind spot. It's the holes of Smithson that, you know, um, the world seems full of holes. And so I think that not hearing the cry of the wolf is, is that blind spot, it's that hole, if that makes sense. Um, and yeah, if I may try to answer, it's, it's a really, really great set of questions um, and to kind of take it from what you're saying on the blind spot. Um, I think the only uh, fleeting um, aspect that is encased in there that's not material is this sense of anxiety um, that um, our current, let's say, uh, culture has to bury those traces. So there is this implicit anxiety that's being also buried in there. Um, but I think the moment you uh make a material trace and you put something on the ground and whether that is you know this man-made geologies that i write about or even the moment you make any kind of architecture i think there at least for me there are certainly blind spots of things being lost and i think other art forms you know like poetry or literature are more capable to um to be more inclusive of these fleeting moments. And I think that, and I would love someone to argue with me. I would love to hear a different <laughs> opinion. Um, but I, I really do think that the moment you make a mark on the ground with any kind of scale, matter, there are things that are lost. I, I think that's a really, without going into too much uh, arguing, which is to say no arguing at all, but I think that that's a really nice way to conclude uh, what, we, what we feel. I think uh, certainly myself and Dan uh, has been a really wonderful conversation between Kathleen, Lydia, and Francesco. And we really thank uh, Jane Kelly, uh, Bob Sommel for uh, offering to host this event, uh, you know, live uh, virtually. It's one of the really uh, one of the few things that uh, the pandemic has really allowed for us for us to as I think it's become something of a cliche at this point in terms of how we're able to connect across vast geographies and to bring people from different corners of the of the planet to speak about um, in this case the the Americas but certainly also well beyond that and I think one of the really wonderful takeaways I think for me and I, I and I might be so bold as to speak for Dan is, uh, the way in which I think uh, this centering of the Americas, actually so many of you brought in so many other aspects of other geographies, time periods, etc., cetera, and what you were mentioning. And for us, that's one of the really, I think, exciting things about the, the way in which we see the journal participating, we hope, in expanding conversations and not necessarily uh, limiting them to a geography. So to that end, we couldn't be, I think, happier. And uh, that also is a way of saying that we really appreciate two out of our 50 contributors joining us uh, today. And certainly we highly recommend there's 48 other really fantastic, along with these wonderful two uh, authors uh, within the journal. And again, thank you so much, uh, Francesco, for being really an incredible interlocutor. I hope we can do more of these. And thank you, Jane and Bob again. And thank you to all of you that tuned in. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Didia, and then Anthony and Dan for inviting us and enjoying this time together. Yes, it's been wonderful. Thank you.
Thank you, yeah, everybody. Thanks. It's great meeting thanks. you. Nice to meet you all too. Thank you so much. I have to say that a priori, any conversation where we can have Annie Dillard and Robert Smithson together makes me happy. <laughs> um, if I was still in front of my bookshelf, I could pull out all the Annie Dillard I have there and I'll have to revisit. Um, although I realized it made me realize I had lent someone Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, which was a huge mistake. Um, you should never ever <laughs> lend a book you love. Um, but yeah, no, thank you everybody so much. I'm gonna, yeah, stop it here, but thank you again. Are we no longer live, Jane? Yeah, we just.